Hey guys, Harv here, and welcome back to the Kerbal Space Program. This is our BOP misadventure, and we have found this thing, the Dead Space Kraken, or one of its children, the Dead Space Kraken, uh, on one of Jules' moons, known as BOP. And in the previous episode, where we basically drove around for miles and miles and miles, we searched the entirety of the Northern Hemisphere for this, for this thing. I said the entirety, okay, that was a bit of an overestimate, um, but it, it was a large distance. It was like up, up to three hours of continuous driving, so we covered a fair amount of distance. And this is our reward, to stand on top of the dead space kraken. We have conquered it! And standing on top is the official and the proper way to determine that. Yes, looking down on our our worthy rover, certainly. It only crashed a record 29 million times for the Kerbal Space Program. Those are very, very good survival statistics. Um, Jebediah Kerman, our pilot for this, or our driver, in fact, will be getting some very good very good reports when he gets back home to Kerbin, which is our job now, and I'm getting called in the background on my phone, so I'm just going to ignore that. Uh, recording, doing YouTube, is my priority at this point in time. So, it is time for us to get back into our vehicle. That ringing is actually annoying me. Never mind, it's stopped now. <laughs> time to get back into our vehicle. It's not like anyone actually calls me anymore. I, I generally just get scam messages like to a 15 year old this is because I'm currently 15 um, I get e I get phone calls like here is your new pension plan it's, just, <laughs> it's brilliant it's brilliant say would you like a new pension plan I say no thanks bye right so we've got back into our into our rover and now we are transferring fuel from those outer tanks back into our inner stage uh, just to top everything up make sure everything is full and that is why we used why that is why we brought them so we could use the engine slightly. Um, but now that's done, we are fully fueled. We can detach those outer stages. There we go, and fall down to the ground, nice and sedately, as they gently tip over, and act as our beacons. Because I don't want to spend another three hours looking for this thing. Despite the fact that I do have the coordinates, and I know roughly where it is based on the surrounding topography. We have these little capsules, these little rover semi-things as our beacons. And we lift off, and now it is time to rendezvous with our command module that is in our roughly 90 degree orbit. So let's do that very quickly. Uh, quickly as in four times speed in an editor. The thing is, those parts we've left behind to act as beacons, it's a very nice idea, but unfortunately it's not actually very practical, because we don't have any uh, probes on them. They aren't controllable or anything, which means that they get deleted, they get classed as debris and subsequently deleted fairly soon. So we can't actually use them, which is a mistake on my half. Shame really, it's a shame actually. But never mind, we've set up our node, because um, obviously being in on basically the North Pole of BOP, we have to get down to an equatorial uh, position, somewhere along the equator, and then we have to burn and get into an equatorial orbit, um, which uses a lot of delta V. Luckily, the gravity is so low that it doesn't actually use that much. It's 242 points... why is that? I, I can't tell. Something meters per second. You'll notice the crossfades are randomly coming in. That's because in editing I screwed up, which is a shame. Um, I could change it now, but I can't be bothered. So let's just warp down. We're trying to get to the point where we cross over. And once we get to that point, we shall burn towards our reticule and make our... Basically come to a full stop and take all that horizontal velocity or all that vertical velocity away and put it into horizontal velocity. And we manage it without much trouble whatsoever. So now it is time to try and rendezvous with our craft, our rover ship that's in orbit. Um, instead of like burning and just getting a immediate, uh, what's it called, an immediate close encounter, um, I'm going to do a bit more sedately. I'm going to get into an orbit that's lower than it, and so 
equal, uh, circularize this orbit and just chase it round until we get closer to it. What I could do is just burn past its orbit and, you know, um, not have to wait at all, just quickly time warp and get our encounter. But we can just jump up bit by bit, increasing our orbital altitude till we get closer and closer. And there we go-ish. Nope, hang on, just a few more burns. Uh, where are we? What is that? Oh, so many, oh, so many kilometers, kilometers separation. More than enough. More than enough. So we'll bring this through, and we just burn towards, trying to keep our prograde marker along our pink, pink reticule, uh, which marks our ship. And here we are, right here, with the Bop Rover Mark One ship waiting for us to be docked to it. Now. I had this mentioned in previous episodes as well, um, why am I bothering to dock? Surely that's a waste of time, we can just stay here, we can EVA out and get in. Um, no, I'd like to bring this thing home, because undoubtedly a rover like this has surely got some spaces for samples and it's always interesting to bring rock samples and matter of the dead space kraken to bring organic flesh of an alien back to Kerbin for analysis. So we're going to dock this thing, there we go. Shaking around a little as we do so, magnetism engaging until eventually we dock fully and the hatches close and the magnets stabilise. We'll transfer all our fuel into the main tank. Uh, it turns out there's actually some left in those up oh, first tanks there. So we're going to put them all in the middle just to kind of bring the centre of mass back a little. Uh, I had the idea that bringing the centre of mass back towards the engines is probably a good idea and it might well be. It, I think it does improve stability somewhat. Um, especially when turning and trying to point in a particular direction. But it doesn't really make that much of a difference. We shall now, now we have docked, we shall EVA Jebediah Kerman. They have a system, or they've got a goal in place, you can tell, because it's actually an option in the right-click context menu, but they should be able to transfer, we should be able to transfer Q, uh, crew through those big docking ports, but we can't currently. Which is a shame, it's actually kind of annoying, but oh well, it's nonetheless, it is surely fun for Jebediah to get out and have a bit of an EVA. So what are we doing now? We are docked, we are in orbit around the BOP, surely the next thing to do is simply to get home. So, let's work on doing that. We have all our fuel, all our fuel which is not quite a lot, it is really not that much, two half tanks and the slight dregs of a large half tank. Um, so really, really not that much. Is it going to be enough to get us home? We shall find out after the break. Okay, break's over. We're going to find out right now. Um, orbiting a little to get those cinematic shots that I oh so love. Man, this, this is this, this is, this is the last episode, I think. Ever. This is the last episode on this computer. Um, I'm using my laptop now with a dual core 2.4 gigahertz Intel i3 CPU and ATI Mobility Radeon HD 5470 512 megabytes graphic graphics card and four gigs of three um, 1333 megahertz RAM. And the quality is not brilliant, and a lot of you have been complaining about the lag. Well, we are going to change this. This will be the last bit video before I bring to you a video of my new computer. Whether the video will actually be of my new computer, or whether it will just be me doing a video on my new computer, I'm not sure. But nonetheless, let's focus on the here and now. Coming to oh so soon, it's coming oh so soon. Um, we shall warp round a little and we've done some planetary time warp and now we are setting up a maneuver node. We've played around a little, we uh, played, played around a little, we've tried a few different positions and um, if we burn prograde and we escape Joule and bring our periapsis down to Kerbin's altitude, we don't get an encounter. Um, we are fairly inclined so it's not too surprising but still, Kerbin does have very very strong gravity so we'd expect to have quite a bit of leniency whilst doing this. Um, nonetheless, doesn't really work, so we're going to keep on trying, keep trying different formula to attempt to get a close encounter. 
um, and we can fade out and there we have our successful encounter after a bit of experimentation and it is time, it is time to perform that maneuver 1041 uh, and well, 1041.7 is that, 0.7 meters per second of delta V is required in order to get us along that trajectory and on our way home. And we only have 300 and something liters of liquid fuel and 400 and something liters of oxidizer. Is it liters or is it gallons? I think it's, I think it's liters. I remember asking this a while ago, but I don't remember what the answer was, so oh well. Let us burn, let us see whether we have the fuel required. So we are out of Bop's sphere of influence, not much of a challenge. We carry on burning and we just about, after a few minutes or so, escape Jules' sphere of influence. There we go, look at this. Burning and burning and burning. Goodbye, Bop. And goodbye, Space Kraken. Thank you very much for your DNA. We shall, we shall be very interested in seeing what tales it, um, what, what story of your evolution it reveals. I mean, surely the Dead Space Kraken is responsible for all those numerical malfunctions we have when the ships are warping. And its ability to affect that, that suggests a very interesting evolution. And, uh, yes, I'm sure the scientists back on Kerbin are looking forward to getting hold of this DNA. So we bring the periapsis down. We bring it down and down. We've deleted the maneuver node, so we're just going off of closest approach, which, speaking of the devil, is right there. Bring it down even more. 300,000, uh, 300 million, 400 million, 200 million, whatever. Oh, so many millions. And our encounter. We got it, and we have absolutely loads of fuel left. What, what, we had something like 300 something litres of liquid fuel? Yeah, we've only got 200 now. <laughs> only used about 100. That is pretty damn good. The efficiency, is, the efficiency of these engines are amazing. Um, of course, we could have used ion engines, uh, but I didn't, because that would take an absolute age. And, as I've already made a lot of fun of. We don't want we don't want to wait that long. We want to get back as soon as possible. There's our periapsis. We've adjusted it and now they're out of Jules inclination. Uh, trying to bring it down as much as possible. Not having an awful lot of success. So we might as well leave it and just carry on warping. At 100,000 times speed and we try and get back down. Now this will take a while but with the magic of video editing we can simply fade out to black and fade back in and we're suddenly a lot closer and we can see our Kerbin periapsis is 3 million meters and 176,000 meters uh, bringing it down we've reached the periapsis of our bowler orbit and now we are going to do a few more inclination changes we're going to try and bring that periapsis down as far as possible because contrary to what seems like popular belief the further away you are from your target, you know, point in space, uh, the more efficient it will be when you perform your manoeuvre. So if you're burning now, you have a greater influence over your long-term trajectory. Uh, so we're burning, what is this, nine days in advance, and it's going to take a lot less fuel to perform our manoeuvre here than it will if we were burning, say, one day in advance. Uh, which is why we're doing this now. It's always best to try and set your trajectory up as early as possible. Not later. Whoever it was that commented that and refused to give up. Not sure if trolling or just being stupid. <laughs> no, to be honest, to be honest, not getting rocket science is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, certainly, it's be it's something to be very proud of if you do understand. And I'm happy to say, I clearly do. So full of myself. Bringing this in, we're warping closer and closer, and we are now within the Kerbin Sphere of Influence. There we go. What is our periapsis? Let us find out. Uh, let's take a looky here. Take a bit of a look-see. What is that? 163,000 meters. Brilliant. I put, I really, really hope I'm getting these numbers right, because my preview display is a fairly, ro is fairly low resolution, so... Yeah, I'm, I was right. 156, 130, 20, 100. Yeah, bringing this down, trying to get it within the atmosphere. 
which is okay that's zero um that's zero meters any reason yes there is a reason actually because now as you as you all know uh our command module does not have any any parachutes on it so the little fuel we have left we transfer into our engine our fuel tank on our landing stage on our rover stage on our everything stage we've reused this engine a lot uh, it's very very important so we're going to transfer all that fuel just bringing it down filling up that half fuel tank uh, probably don't need to do this because to land we have the atmosphere we don't need to slow down out of orbit or anything but you know it's good for, in case of emergencies there we go we can EVA get Jebediah Kerman out of there bring him round and get him back into the lander from whence he came once he is inside it is simply a matter of undocking and we have left this command module on its way down to crash into the surface of Kerbin pretty awesome stuff let's RCS away from that yeah we don't want to crash let's uh, let's change our trajectory spin this thing around uh, I think we're coming in we're coming in towards 270, so if we burn in the 270 direction, we should be able to raise our periapsis. And there we go, 61,000 meters. Bit too high, bit too high, 24,000, that's a lot better. And now, it is simply a matter of time warping down. We've come so far, we've travelled across the entire solar system, and now we are on the home stretch. Turn on that engine, go into cinematic mode, and we can time warp away as our faithful command pod sails away into the milky blackness. And Kerbin, out of the same milky blackness, gets ever, ever closer. <sighs> so poetic. That is, that is what space is all about, poetry, it's just beautiful. If you can really appreciate the wonders that this game has to offer, then man, it feel it fills you with such good feelings. It is, I, I said recently, I was uh, doing some messages, I was messaging Matty G, who you may all remember, um, he's the one who suggested the next game we're going to be doing on the channel. Not the next one, another game we're adding. We're going to carry on doing KSB because it's so brilliant. But um, I, I was saying to him, it's hard for me to decide upon another game because I've been spoiled by KSP. I really have. The game is just so brilliant. It's open world. No, it's not even open world. It's open solar system. It's open universe. You can go anywhere if you have the capability, the knowledge and the power you can literally do whatever pleases you the most, whether it's blowing up rockets on a launch pad, or whether it's visiting one of a gas giant's moons, and hunting for dead space kraken. This game literally provides everyone with entertainment, no matter what you fancy. Of course, if you're a Call of Duty fanboy, then maybe it doesn't, but still, it is just too beautiful. Look at that. This is on the lowest graphical settings, and that still looks incredible. I cannot wait until we get the new computer. Coming on Tuesday. Depending on when this is uploaded, that shall be very, very soon. Thank you very much for watching the video, guys. This has been the end of our BOP misadventure with Jebediah Kerman, your pilot, and HOC Gaming, your mission director. <sighs> Man, space is beautiful. Thank you very much for watching the video, and I shall see you all next time.